As you've seen, I enjoy dissecting the conversations of popular figures involved in the peptide space, and quite honestly, there aren't many. That said, I like it. It's nice to not only hear others' points of view, but also seeing how other people interpret limited data and controversial viewpoints is fascinating. Let's get into a conversation between Derek from More Plates, More Dates and Dr. Peter Atia once again. It's really funny to me because there are some individuals out there with medical and clinical backgrounds who discuss peptide research, but I find myself predominantly agreeing with Derek, whose background does not lie in that field. However, you can tell he very critically reads the studies that have been done and, to be fair, draws logical conclusions about what we know and what we don't. Before we get started, if you haven't already, just give us a like and subscribe. It's the best way to support the channel. If you're interested in financially supporting us for $5 a month, feel free to join as a member where you'll get special shoutouts, can make regular video requests, and we'll have access to member-only videos. Regardless, join or don't join, I'm still going to make videos based on peptides the research, what we know, what we don't. Thank you all in advance. In this conversation, Atia and Derek address growth hormone, which is considered to be the fountain of youth, which is pretty unanimously a bit hyperbolic. And since most of the peptides we discuss are involved in the GHRH pathway, i.e. production of growth hormone and IGF-1 through different binding sites, this is an interview worth diving into. I think in this case, it's worth some background info to exhibit why this discussion is, in my opinion, pretty darn important. There are plenty of peptides and peptide combos that interact at different segments within this pathway. For instance, sermorolin is a GHRH analog that sits at the top of the pathway, the most upstream, analogous to growth hormone releasing hormone, which is a hypothalamic hormone. Meanwhile, ipamorelin and MK677, which is technically a non-peptide, interacts at the ghrelin growth hormone secretagogue receptor to stimulate growth hormone release from the pituitary. Further downstream, we have the likes of IGF-1, LR3, analogous to the downstream product IGF-1, and I imagine a lot of people find this space through segue from the TRT slash steroid space. And so we have a lot of preconceived notions about how endocrinologic pathways work, and I think it can blur our interpretations of how growth hormone release feedback may operate. For instance, let's take testosterone cypionate. It's a popular form of the compound injected by many of those on TRT. This half-life is eight days. If we inject growth hormone itself, we're looking at a half-life between 15 minutes and a half hour. Thus, feedback mechanisms may not be as clear-cut, especially given the diverse activity the different parts of the pathway are involved in. Right, this growth hormone releasing hormone pathway involves the hypothalamus, pituitary, liver, and the stomach, which are closely intertwined with regards to release and production of growth hormone. Not to mention, these particular parts of our body physiologically serve plenty of other functions and release other molecules. Tell people about what growth hormone is, where it comes from, you know, what are the challenges of measuring it? Let's, let's just do kind of a growth hormone 101. Yeah, so growth hormone is, most people know it as like the primary hormone responsible for determining height as you grow in adolescence. Like, you know, androgens are more sexual differentiation, maturation, but um, growth hormone and the subsequent growth factor production, IGF-1, will be a fairly significant determinant on if you grow to, I guess, like target height, whatever you could become. And it's pretty, like during puberty especially pretty important for the proper development of your infrastructure bone etc connective tissue as you get into adulthood it becomes one of those things where it drops significantly first off as you reach adulthood and as you get older it drops precipitously as well and that kind of begs the question is this one of those things that you should be replacing to optimize you know function fat loss vitality. Exactly. It's no secret that growth hormone is a function of age, as in it peaks throughout adolescence and as we become older, it decreases. But does this indicate need to replenish it? That's unclear. Because like most normal physiologic functions in our body, there's a purpose behind it. Well, obviously, after a certain point, the body would not want to strengthen diffuse growth signaling. Moreover, possibly its reduction throughout adulthood is actually protective against cancer and maybe even insulin resistance. So sure, it's the fountain of youth while you're youthful, but perhaps its natural reduction is to prevent deleterious effects of prolonged exposure. And I always try to emphasize this concern when dealing with growth hormone promoting peptides. It is often framed out to be like this fountain of youth elixir, you know, HGH. Oh, it's, you know, so cost prohibitive. It's what all the pro athletes are using. This is the thing you need to be on to prevent any age related decline in, you know, bone strength, uh, you know, not your ability to burn fat as you get older is going to go down. So you need to be on growth hormone, et cetera, et cetera. And that is kind of a, 
like at a bird's eye view, it's kind of responsible for the growth of broad spectrum growth of tissues as you grow up. And then as you get into adulthood, it becomes, it's not irrelevant, but it's far less important because you're not trying to, you know, push a human from, you know, childhood into adulthood, essentially. And even when you have this push of exogenous growth hormone to manually manipulate your levels after it's called epiphyseal plate closure, there does not seem to be any benefit to be gained from enhancing like the length of bones, for example, like you could still enhance um, bone mineral density to some extent. And it seems to be, you know, you could enhance connective tissue integrity, it kind of depends on what your situation is and how IGF-1 deficient or lack thereof you are. Derek is highlighting right now pretty much what we just discussed, in that when there's less of a need, there is ambiguity in assessing utility. For instance, a 35-year-old who wants to grow a couple inches may be a bit delusional, but an otherwise healthy elderly person who wants to reduce risk of a hip fracture, for instance, may have more of my support. And we'll get this out of the way right now. If you're still developing, messing with your endocrinology, if not medically indicated, it's strongly, strongly, strongly not recommended. It's not going to really do anything other than regulate um, like lipolytic action. Um, How does it do that, by the way? It just like, liberates free fatty acids into circulation. So it's kind of seen as the opposing hormone to insulin. So it's like when growth. Does it do that through lipoprotein lipase? I mean, what is it actually acting on a substrate with on the adipocyte? That it seems to be driven through different like baseline I don't know, states that you're in. Like if you have, you know, ghrelin receptor agonism from being fasted, for example, a lot of people point to the literature on if you're deprived of calories, oh, growth hormone goes up. If there are different situations in which it'll go up, deep sleep, obviously super impactful on if you're going to have release or not as well. But the main actions that I'm aware of, at least in a state of growth hormone pulsation is kind of the underpinnings are you are trying to liberate free fatty acids for utilization as substrate for energy or anti-catabolic action. So a lot of people turn to growth hormone releasing peptides to not only improve sleep and recovery, but also for its predominantly perceived use as a fat loss tool, or better yet, to improve lean body mass to adiposity ratios. And it's shown it may be able to do that understandably in growth hormone deficient people and the elderly, but it may even accelerate fat loss in those with an appropriate caloric deficit, which is of course a confirmed founding factor given it's tough to control for protein intake, however it was reportedly done, as well as activity levels and sleep quality. And growth hormone has shown it can improve lean body mass generally, but not necessarily fat loss, and how it does so is unclear given the complex physiologic pathways with which it interacts. It is known to stimulate lipolysis or breakdown of fat into fatty acids and theoretically does so by interaction with PPAR gamma, which is involved in insulin sensitivity amongst other biological components, and therein lies possible increased susceptibility to insulin resistance. And interestingly, morning peak of glucose dysregulation in those with diabetes is suspected to be attributed to growth hormone release. So people may lose fat with peptides that encourage growth hormone release, but does it come with a metabolic cost? So the actual like mechanism enzymatically and whatnot, it's a bit fuzzy. And what's the relationship then between GH and IGF in the liver? How does this all work? Because we don't really measure GH in people, right? Because it's pulsatile. So what are we stuck with as a proxy? Yeah, even if you inject GH, like a large dose of it, you will only see a spike in serum for a transient period of time. And people who are trying to assess the quality of their growth hormone back in the, you know, with the underground stuff, they would be trying to time it very specifically down to the minute to assess the quality of their stuff. But the best proxy for... GH production endogenously seems to be widely accepted as IGF-1, which is after you produce growth hormone from the pituitary, there is action in the liver, but also paracrine and autocrine action on, you know, muscle, especially if you are exercising, resistance training. But a lot of the serum IGF-1 is driven through liver production, and that is has its own implications in terms of its effects that seem to be more it's like intelligenic in itself to some extent and um 
And this is why when people use peptides that encourage growth hormone release, it's pretty hard to detect physiologically at least what they're doing. GH, as Derek said, is pulsatile, and so when people use most of these peptides with similarly short half-lives, like sermorolins purportedly 11 to 12 minutes and tesamorolins approximately half an hour, you're essentially replicating pulsatile activity. Where this uniquely differs is with CJC-1295 with DAC, given its half-life is about 6 to 8 days, and MK677 or ibutan and that probably sits at about six hours. So most of what people report is anecdotal. However, the fact that Samorolin was FDA regulated for idiopathic childhood growth hormone deficiency at some point, and others have shown an ability to increase GH and IGF-1, their mechanisms are legit. But creating goals with regards to biomarkers is complicated. Yeah, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Because if IGF-1 has insulogenic properties, which are promoting a fat storage, and GH is promoting lipolysis don't those act at odds with each other and how how, how does how does one sort of uh become more dominant yeah it's this weird orchestrated feedback loop and these feedback loops are present in the body in multiple you know multiple different uh i don't know hormone substrates will reduce in multiple different metabolites that then have negative feedback through different systems and this seems to be no different if you have gh at a certain level and it results in a certain amount of igf1 you will have negative feedback that will then lower your production of hgh this is essentially what I was trying to highlight earlier. There's a lot we don't know, and this growth hormone releasing hormone pathway is a lot more than meets the eye. There are plenty of other components that act on this axis, from ghrelin to somatostatin and liver function. IGF-1 alone, as they're hinting at, can be responsible for both improved insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance, which draws us back to the original question, is growth hormone worth repleting as it decreases with age? And as you can tell, that's a darn tough question to answer. And we'll top this conversation off with some food for thought, or since this is a peptide channel, amino acids for thought, I really do hate myself sometimes. But all in all, as my regular viewers know, I try to emphasize the knowns, the unknowns, risks, and benefits surrounding use of all of these peptides, even the ones that are less experimental in nature. And even though they aren't just talking about peptides here, what Derek and Peter share is certainly translational to an extent. There's a lot we don't know about growth hormone, and most of the people telling you it's an elixir of sorts is trying to sell you something. And as we discussed in my most recent video comparing the three most popular GHRH analogs, quick plug, a lot of the differences between these GH releasing peptides, besides clinical data and trials and anecdote, is their half-life. Compounds with longer half-lives circulate for a longer period of time. Sure, that has benefit if you're trying to take something as infrequently as possible, but also likely prolongs adverse effects if it's something you're not tolerating. That said, I hope you enjoyed this video and the conversation. Hammer that like, that subscribe, and talk to you soon.